The next case today is in re adoption of JPB and MMB. In this case, you'll have 15 minutes to argue. Since there's no one to rebut, you'll have your, your 15 minutes and no rebut time to rebut today. The arguments are being recorded, so if you would please, number one, introduce yourself uh, for the record when you come up. Make sure when you uh, make the argument that you stay behind the podium as best you can and speak loudly so we can continue to pick you up on the record. As we've done in the briefs in this case, please refer to children or other parties being protected by initial or some other term. And the judge, the read your briefs are ready to proceed whenever you're ready to proceed. Thank you. We are recording. Okay. Thank you, Your Honors. May I please report? Good morning. My name is Attorney Jill Cave. Um, I'm here on behalf of the appellant, Jamie Pohl, who is the biological mother of um, JPB and MMB, the children who are the subject of the adoption in this case. Um, and I'm here today to discuss with you the two assignments of error that Ms. Pohl is raising in her appeal to the finalized order of the adoption of her children. Um, <clears throat> the first issue that I am bringing to your attention is that one of notice and a violation of Ms. Pohl's due process rights. Um, uh, my argument is that Ms. Pohl was not properly served and therefore the probate court does not have jurisdiction over the case. Um, there was an uh, affidavit filed by um, the counsel for the petitioner claiming um, due diligence, however, Ms. Pohl never received actual or potentially constructive notice that the adoption had been filed. Um, publication was effected pursuant to Civil Rule 73. However, um, the affidavit that was filed with the trial court claimed um, only two areas where the petitioner and or her attorney um, made an effort to find Ms. Pohl. One was, quote, social media, and um, the other was asking relatives and friends if they had any information about the whereabouts of Ms. Pohl. Um, based on the fact that Ms. Pohl subsequently, in um, September of 23, filed a motion in Summit County Juvenile Court for modification of visitation for those two children, um, uh, it is clear proof from that filing that she actually did not have notice of um, the adoption of her children. Um, in addition, Ms. Pohl was entitled to counsel thanks to the Supreme Court's ruling in NRA YEF in December of 2020, and because she did not have notice, of the filing, she was unavailable. She was um, unable to avail herself of that right to counsel. On the notice question, yes, sir. Are the facts you're discussing in some way in front in, in the record before the probate court at this point in time? You fought some 60 B or something to allege all these things are true, and then the court said no, those things are true, but we think no is appropriate. Or are you just appealing the decision from the magic decision or the judge that didn't adopt the magic decision, and there's no other independent basis for the fact? Yes and yes. Um, we have filed a 60B motion. Another attorney has handled that prong. Um, and the facts that I am alleging today are not um, presently in front of the trial court for reconsideration. So I am. So there's a 60B that, that's not subject to this appeal but an independent proceeding in front of the probate court? That's correct. And that was just filed, I believe, last week. Timely. Um, but these are two separate strands that we're pursuing. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Um, the other um, argument that I'm raising on behalf of Ms. Pohl is that um, Ms. Bahanna um, Holly, who is the petitioner for the adoption and the um, appellee in this case, um, who is ineligible to adopt under statute. And so um, Ohio Revised Code Section 3107.16 states clearly who's eligible to adopt. And based on, and I'm going to use Holly because there's two people named Bahanna. Um, the father of the children's last name is Bahanna, and Holly marries that man's biological brother, whose last name is also Bahanna. Holly then becomes a Bahanna subsequent to her marriage. So if it's okay, I think it's easier to follow along if I use first names. Um, so Holly marries Bruce, but she marries Bruce prior to the final decree of adoption being issued. And the statute is, is quite clear. Um, it states who can adopt. And if a married couple is adopting, it can be a husband and wife together, at least one of whom is an adult. But um, Bruce is not on the petition to adopt. Holly so, is adopting family. In, in looking at your argument, one of the first questions I have uh, is, um, is this like a standing issue? In other words, these are the people that are eligible to have an interest in adopting. So standing is, um, an issue that you look at at the beginning of the case. So what does it really matter then if her uh, 
marital status changed because when she first filed the application for adoption, she was an eligible person under the statute. She was, but she lost her eligibility upon her marriage. That's my argument. So you're saying it doesn't matter just that they were standing at the beginning, you have to maintain that standing? That's correct, because the children aren't effectively adopted until the final order comes out. And at the issuance of the final order, she did not have standing to adopt. Is that really statute really about standing, or is it a public policy issue that you have a couple? So you can certainly argue standing, as the judge suggested. It also is a public policy issue because the goal of adoption is to create permanency in the lives of the children. And so at this point, if the adoption were permitted to stand, their legal mother would be Holly. But Bruce, who is married to Holly, is not their father, has no rights to them. And so if Bruce were to petition subsequently to adopt the children, he would potentially eradicate, it would complicate Holly's right to the children, which is why a husband and wife can adopt together. Had she waited to be married and adopted? If he filed a stepfather adoption, I don't know why that would complicate Holly's rights. She'd still be mom. He would be fine. His own, he'd be fine to petition a stepfather adoption. That happens all the time. That doesn't cut off the original natural. He could. Typically, stepfathers file to adopt when they are married to the natural mother. And then the natural mother then consents. I am not aware of a case, and I did look, I did pretty thoroughly scrub Westlaw to find something that matched this particular set of facts. Well, why would that matter, though, once the adoption was finalized as to Holly? It doesn't matter whether you're a biological parent or not. You are the legal parent of that child. Holly is. Yes, if the adoption were permitted to stand. I was going to ask the same question that Judge Stevenson was, and that is, why would it matter a step-parent adoption? Well, I'm not sure that Bruce, as a step-parent, would be eligible to adopt. I think it might complicate Holly's rights. But because he would be essentially asking their current mother to consent to his adoption, I guess they could try that. That's not happened, as far as I know. Instead, the children, should the adoption be permitted to stand, would remain Holly's. But I'm arguing that Holly actually didn't comply with the statute. And I don't understand why it would have been such a burden to wait, make sure the adoption was finalized, and then be married. And the adoption, the final decree of adoption, was issued in her married name. So the court was aware that she married during the pendency of the case. In the record, all we see is a magistrate's decision, or I should say, it is a decision, but a recommendation, basically. But it's a title that order that says that, you know, that the custody of the children that enabled Holly to begin with, to have custody of the kids. Is there a trial court order? Was that, all we see is a magistrate's order, which obviously is not sufficient. What I gave you is what I could find, based on my survey of the in-camera, my in-camera survey of the record at the trial court level. So, if the record is incomplete, or I know that it's quite possible that some items were removed from the record prior to our in-camera review, which was December 1st, I believe. I can't speak to that, quite honestly. I provided you as much as I could, based on what I had. Thank you. Yes. So, there was an issue with notice. It impacted her fundamental parental rights. It impacted her due process rights. It impacted Holly's right to an attorney. I would offer that the adoption is void on that problem. And the secondary argument, as we've discussed a little more fully, is that Holly was no longer a person eligible to adopt under the Ohio statute. And I would request not that the statute be applied as to when she filed, but when the adoption was actually approved. What would be your remedy in regard to if we took the position that she was not eligible? Would that mean, in your opinion, that a whole new petition would have to be filed? It would. And quite to be transparent, that is my goal anyway. I understand that. Yes. But yes. I mean, honestly, I think it would be better that a new petition be filed and that both of them adopt together. So, it wouldn't have sufficed to, I know there was amendments, but it wouldn't have sufficed to have an amendment, add him as a petitioner, and then done a new home study and so forth? It's certainly possible. I mean, quite 
frankly, that's probably a decision for the trial court. They have more experience navigating those kinds of obstacles. Thank you. Um, there is a case law in Ohio that supports um, my client, Jamie Pohl's arguments in terms of the deficiencies in notice and um, that the adoption may be void. I'd ask the court to consider in re adoption of Nipper, 1986. In this case, a mother filed, uh, she did file a 60B motion four years after the adoption was finalized. But I think the holding of the court um, illustrates that uh, the lack of reasonable diligence is sufficient to defeat the petitioner's argument that the adoption should proceed. And I think we do have a lack of reasonable diligence in this case when we look at the, the first prong argued in, in Jamie's brief about um, sufficiency of notice and the diligence in just checking, writing in social media and saying basically we asked around. Um, so I would ask the court to take a look at um, the attempt to use constructive notice because they didn't use, was flawed because they didn't use reasonable notice. I think that's spot on with Nipper um, in this case. And um, I'm not, I am not going to say that the lack of um, due diligence on the part of the petitioner in the adoption rises to the level of fraud. Um, I do want to point out the obvious that it is definitely in the petitioner's advantage to not be able to find the respondent in the adoption case and therefore it allows the case to proceed much more smoothly, especially now that opposing counsel may be involved. But I am not familiar with Holly's motives in doing this or those of her attorney. I will just say that it, it doesn't appear sufficient. Well, there were um, later on um, actual uh, an actual address was used, and that was returned to the court, undeliverable, right? So the filings about mailing notice are really strange because <laughs> there. I that's why I made the little table because it's hard for me to keep them straight too. Um, things were filed. Um, one attempt was made at regular mail to an address that obviously petitioners supply and it was returned, it was not filed on the docket until well after some of the original decisions had come out. I don't know if that was just a clerical oversight, but, but it's strange they did not typically follow um, regular mail certified mail publication, which is, though not required by Civil Rule 73, kind of accepted practice in terms of looking for notification. Um, <clears throat> So I suppose to summarize, although she has, um, she's, she's timely filed her appeal, um, she's raised serious issues of uh, fact and law regarding the, the sufficiency of the adoption, the legality of the adoption, the sufficiency of her notice. Um, I think that the fact that she has filed, she did file a juvenile court completely unaware that the adoption was pending. In fact, and I, and I mentioned this anecdotally in the brief, she didn't know their children had been adopted until the juvenile court magistrate ruled against her motion for visitation. And in fact, that was not even in a hearing. Her attorney was told in the hallway and the order was issued without a hearing. Um, so I think that that definitely shows that while she certainly didn't receive actual notice and the constructive notice was flawed based on the lack of due diligence and a lack of due diligence is sufficient to defeat constructive notice following the effort. Um, in that case, I would request that the court um, reverse the um, decision of the trial court and remand. Um, I would argue that the trial court would hopefully then decide that the adoption is void and allow Miss um, Holly to repetition if she still desires to adopt or give my client an opportunity to refile the juvenile court. Um, and she's not and has not filed for custody. She was just filing for modification of visitation for her children. And I thank you for your presentation today. The court will take the matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. The clerk court will mail a copy of that decision to you when it comes out. It will also be available on the High Supreme Court website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.